OK. Well, welcome everyone. <clears throat> the. Um, the first thing I want to say is that. Um, I had been a few weeks behind updating the website <clears throat> and it's uh, fully updated now. I think that the videos from the last weeks, the links are live. Um, I was looking back, as I usually do, at the files that I have available to me in the chat. I usually ask if you're a guest speaker to share the files in chat. And George may have um, sent me her talk by email, but I couldn't locate it, and it wasn't in the chat. Sophie, I don't think I got your talk. You may have sent it by email, but I, I couldn't locate it just before here. Matt shared Docker files <clears throat> um, in the chat, but I couldn't download them. It was like a permissions thing, but we have the videos and it's probably uh, it's probably OK for today. Um, I decided to uh, myself talk about rather than talk again about um, chat GPT and and AI um, <clears throat> just for the entrance of efficiency and breaking it up a little bit. I had been working on a project to do with plain old experimental design and power analysis. And um, because I have had quite a lot of projects to go, I thought it made more sense to share this project and also break up the topics again. So that's what I've done today. The, if you want to code along, I'll walk you through it and give you time in the future. Don't do it now. Um, but I've got a zip here with the project files, and I've also got um, some slides that I'm going to go to first. Now, in the future, <clears throat> next week, um, Matt and Harry Buckley have been working on, uh, I don't see Harry in the chat, um, but they have been working on progressing that Docker uh, image idea from last week. and. Um, <clears throat> we reviewed it this morning in my lab meeting, and uh, my mind is blown, really. I can't wait to see a demo of this. So I think what the plan is next week is um, Matt and possibly Harry also will go through how this uh, app system works. It's a computer vision model counting wheat heads. Some of us worked on that a little while back, but it's been containerized and uh, launched to the web. And I... I think it's correct to say it's not very hard to do that, but it's incredibly impressive. I, I'm, my mind was blown. Um, week after that, we'll be looking for a volunteer. I hope somebody can volunteer. Week after that, we have a volunteer, even since this morning's email. So um, Soteria has been, her project involves bioinformatics, and she's been using this ecosystem of um, programmatic tools on the Galaxy server, so she'll be talking to us about her adventures with that. And then the week after that, I'll do something. Um, <clears throat> all right, without further ado, if you want to catch up with the, uh, the slides, go ahead and download them. Links in the chat or the page. And otherwise, I'm just going to launch into the slides. Okay, does everybody see that? Oh dear, I just hate it when it does that. <clears throat> I may just leave it like this because as you know, I like it like this to mark up on the uh, on the screen. So I think I will just leave it like this. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna give a little background and then I'm just gonna show you the code that I did. The spirit of this is a little different than what I usually do. This isn't meant so much as a lecture, but just the context for a real full speed simulation experiment that I did for one of my colleagues here at Harper. Um, we don't need to know the details of who it is or anything. Some of you, if you do research in this area, you'll be able to figure out probably who it is pretty easily. It's not anonymous or sensitive, and yet I'm sharing the data, and so I don't feel the need to um, give more detail than is necessary. I want to focus on the, the statistical tools here. Uh, and we've talked a lot about experimental design over the years here. You know that I love that. You know that I think it's important. 
you know that it's an area of my expertise. But a thing we've never talked about in here that I can recall is <clears throat> we've mostly talked about power analysis. When you're designing an experiment and you think about your expected um, difference or your uh, expected effect size, um, we usually have talked about uh, just doing what we call power analysis, a straightforward calculation to uh, to estimate the sample size required to meet an adequate power. For those of you who are new to the meeting, I'll define what power is and talk about effect size. And they're jargon terms in experimental design, but I'll go through what they mean. But actually, in reality, for most modern experimental designs, it's actually not very easy to calculate power. Um, it, it, we can estimate it with simple tools, but to directly calculate power and therefore to directly estimate um, the required expected sample size, it, it actually is not easy. Now I'm saying that with the, the full weight of my own experience behind it. I like power analysis. I've read Jacob Cohen's uh, magnum opus about power and have studied it many for often over the years. And I still don't think it's very easy to do it for complex experimental designs, e even ones that are um, just a little more than simple in complexity. So the, the other way that we calculate power for these rather than the simple analytical tools that Cohen uh, talked about is through simulation. So I'm going to I'm going to tell you a little bit about this experimental design, tell you a little bit why it's more complicated than the simplest of designs. And then I'm going to just demonstrate the code that I did for the simulation. And I thought people might like to see um, the little bit of work. I don't talk about it very much. The work that I do as a statistical consultant here at the university. Uh, I've done this my whole career, consulting mostly in academia, but sometimes in um, in uh, <clears throat> the business world too. So I've, I've ended up with a very terse statistical experimental design report as well in our markdown, of course. So I'll I'll even if we have time, step through the steps of doing that and you can kind of have a look. I've given you all the code, 100 percent of the uh, work that I did on this report it took me about two days of time. OK, so first, to review, what is statistical power? And uh, in in brief, statistical power is just the probability of detecting a statistical difference. Usually, we're talking about an experiment here. I'm going to go this really fast and with very little detail. We've gone over it many times before, but um, we could have, uh, and there are entire modules and, and courses about it about experimental design and power. As a matter of fact, um, the tradition in PhD programs uh, in America, we have longer to train PhD students in the American system than we have here. But in the American system, every PhD student in science would take uh, at least a one semester course for, for 10 or 12 weeks in experimental design. So we can't spend a lot of time in this, but we won't do so today. We can just think of power <clears throat> as the, um, the probability of detecting a statistical difference. Now, this is a conditional probability. So uh, this is detecting that statistical difference from an experiment, given that there actually is a, a real difference in the real world. And so the idea is that, you know, in this simple experiment, there are two conditions, green and red, and we've we've measured something over here on the y-axis, and uh, the bars, the whiskers on this box plot represent the the variation between individuals in each of those treatments, and the degree to which the pattern we detect here, and the the pattern is based on the mean difference, that would be you know, in the simplest case, so two sample means here, um, the difference between the means. But we also need to consider the variation. So um, 
for for two means, it might be the uh, standard deviation or or the variance uh, around that. Now, <clears throat> um, in reality, if we were omniscient, instead of just doing science, um, we would know the answer to whether there's a difference based on our experimental design. So in the in the real world, oh, it seems like I've got like a setting on my slides and they're automatically forwarding, which really irritates me. If it does it again, I may pause and just and just sort that out before we go on. Um, <clears throat> so in the real world, we know there it's true that there's a difference or it's false that there's a difference. That's the real world. But up here, as a result of your test, it's based on you know your sample and the sampling error that comes along with the sample that you've chosen. If we if we conclude true in this case, that's correct. That's a uh, a true positive difference that we've detected. Uh, <clears throat> now, if it's false in the real world, and we conclude false, that's a true negative. That's also good. Both of these are the desired results. Our experiment relates to the real world. But it's these other two um, possibilities that give us trouble. If we conclude true when there actually is no difference, it's false. We have a false positive. And for every experiment, we have some probability of uh, making this mistake, a false positive. Uh, we set the probability that we're going to, the maximum probability that we're going to accept to commit a false positive at 5%. That's the traditional level to set it at. And that's where this 0 0.05 comes from that we compare our p-value to. So if our p-value is less than 5%, then we, we uh, reject the null and accept that uh, there's a difference. That's where it comes from. It's the probability of making a false positive mistake. But it's this box up here that is the worst box to be in. This is a false negative. Now here, you're a scientist, you spent all your time setting up an experiment, and in the real world, you were right. You, your hypothesis is true, but based on your experiment and your data, you conclude false, there's no, there's no difference. This is the worst case scenario. It, it is a complete fail. Uh, you've wasted your time and you got the wrong answer. I mean, it, it really is the worst. It can't even be very unethical to fall into this box. Imagine that you're doing an experiment involving animals or, or even humans, or involving the destruction of some samples in an economic setting. This is a complete waste. You've wasted this resource and, and possibly unnecessarily harmed individuals. So it's bad. I don't want to lay it on too thick, but it's it's considered to be really bad to com to commit this um, this mistake. Now there's there's some good news and there's some bad news. Um, the good news about this bad mistake that could be made is that scientists it, it is considered scientists are fully in control of the probability of uh, of committing a false negative. Down here in the false positive, in, in theory, you're fully in control of what the value that you set the alpha to is. You, you could set the alpha to, to 0 0.10 instead of 0 0.05, for example. You could do that. But the rest of the scientific world would not accept that. And so in practice, you can't alter the 0 0.05. But up here, um, you choose what your power is. It, it turns out that the, the, the probability of 
emitting this false negative is called beta, alpha and beta, right? And the accepted, um, the accepted maximum for this beta, this this probability of committing the false positive is 20.2. That's that's generally considered to be the uh, the desirable level. But we usually talk about this probability in terms of power. And we calculate power as uh, one minus beta, okay? So that's where the 80, power of 80%, if you've heard me say that quite a lot, that's where that comes from. Okay. So um, now your power is related to this uh, this quantity called the effect size. And remember, I referred to this before, it's the difference in means, uh, and it is the variation for this equation. I usually only talk about Cohen's D. I think I'm gonna change the color of this so we can see it better. But, but actually for samples, Cohen's D is for the population sample when we're, when we're measuring the whole population. Usually Welch's G, I don't talk about this very much in here, probably not at all, but um, Welch's G corrects for sampling error. So when we say Cohen's D, we almost always actually mean Welch's G. All right, so the way that we calculate this, it, there are some variations on this, but the simplest way to think about it is it's just that mean difference divided by the pooled standard deviation. So literally it's just this difference divided by the variation. Simple. And uh, that that researcher I mentioned, Cohen, Jacob Cohen, he gave us some rules of thumb to uh, think about the different effect sizes. So these rules of thumb were basically a, a little bit of a signpost for what he considered to be average effect sizes. So Jacob Cohen would say that if you calculate a Cohen's D that's about 0.2, that it corresponds to a small effect size. You calculate a Cohen's D of 0.5, that corresponds to about a medium effect size. Okay, so these are just rules of thumb. 0.8 is large. Again, it's quite, quite simple, quite practical. So uh, with this effect size, this is one of the really important concepts for doing any kind of experiment. Um, a, a lot of times in practice, though, um, we, we think about all the other details and we think about collecting our data as fast as possible. And then we'll worry about this uncomfortable subject of statistics later on. It's a big mistake to, to face things like that. Because if you don't collect enough data, you'll be much more likely to commit that error where you uh, have a false positive, false negative. Okay, so <clears throat> for the effect size and power, we, we know that the power you have in your experiment depends on the effect size and the sample size. Okay. So if you have a small effect size, you automatically know you need a, a relatively bigger sample size compared to a situation where you had a, a larger effect size. So we know this relationship. It's very well known. It's very empirically understood. It's theoretically understood. And because the sample size, you know, the researcher cannot control the effect size. That's a, that's a, a real-world phenomenon that you're prone to, but you can control the sample size. So controlling the sample size is the very least you can do so that you don't waste your time. Uh, now, 
I say the researcher is in control, but I wanted to say that they're in control most of the time. You know, you want to do an experiment, and I'll, I'll just go through this scenario. I think it'll be quite plain, my point. But um, the research is in control most of the time because it is not uncommon for somebody to come to me and say, Ed, I want to do a really good job here. I want power analysis help. I would like to discuss this with you. And I say, fantastic. What's your effect size? I have no idea. So that we're already starting off on a very compromised position. We have to guess if we don't have some kind of pilot data or something. And uh, then I say, OK, well, it, maybe do you have confidence to expect whether you will, will have a small difference, medium difference, a large difference, this kind of thing? You know, I can go through this kind of thing, or maybe there's some pilot data and we can extract an effect size from it. OK, you can do all of that. It's not uncommon around this stage of the conversation to, um, to uh, come across a situation where, <clears throat> where uh, somebody says, oh, by the way, I have uh, my sample size is eight. We've got eight cows. And uh, OK, um, if you have eight cows and you're going to do the experiment, there's no need to do a, a uh, power analysis. If you already know your sample size, and you have already decided definitely to do the experiment, there's no need to do a power analysis. But if you know your sample size and you can you can guess or you know your, your effect size, you can still do a power analysis and gain knowledge from it if it's going to help you decide whether or not to do the experiment. Because if you have very low statistical power, you probably shouldn't do the experiment if you have a hard constraint on a sample size that will lead to that low experimental power, okay? Then that should be pretty clear. Now, uh, the effect size is, you know, it's very easy to calculate for simple tests. T-test, one-way ANOVA, correlation has a different um, form of effect size that it's also very easy to calculate. Tests that compare means in a simplistic way. Two-way ANOVAs are also pretty straightforward to do this on, and, and some other related tests. But when we get to non-parametric tests, um, now the simple non-parametric tests that are the equivalent of the t-test and ANOVA, what we know about them is that um, the power tends to be lower than their, their parametric alternatives. But calculating it is not straightforward like it is for the simple tests uh, because of the, the different distributions that are involved uh, in potential data that you have. And, and linear models as well, especially linear mixed effects models, are not, um, they're not easy at all. They're quite hard to calculate empirically. Not only that, um, you have to you have to work, do some manual calculations. Well, we do them with computer most of the time, but there are quite a lot of parameters that have to be put into place for a, a linear model, even if it has a, a handful of terms. If it's not Gaussian, and if there are especially random effects, if it's a mixed model. Okay, so what we know, though, is that mixed effects models are very common. You know, they're, they're extremely common. And so we have this issue, this problem. So the last little concept I need to introduce before I go to the coding is the concept of uh, Latin square designs. This is a really old fashioned experiment. Sometimes in these meetings, when we're talking about statistical concepts, I ask, who do you think invented this statistical tool? And uh, a lot of the time, the answer is what? It's R.A. Fisher. R.A. Fisher contributed to the, um, the invention of the Latin square design. It's the kind of design where you have, it's <clears throat> characterized by a, by a grid, 
like this, and the, it's characterized by the grid having an equal number of rows and columns. This is a cl classic balanced Latin square. There are many variations on this, but this is the classic case that I've drawn for you here. A couple of attributes that are important to keep in mind is that um, if, if it's a grid like this, a four by four grid, that means that there were, will be four treatments and it means that there will be four cohorts going through the treatments. Because of the nature of um, the Latin squares, each of the cohorts will encounter a different, uh, a lot of times these are done through time or they're done in space. It's, it's usually one of those two. If this were a field and we had four treatments in a field, we'd have uh, one cohort of treatments and they'd be in a particular order in space. Um, and the order you see is different for each column and each row. So the treatments are mixed with each other with regard to space. So in field experiments, it's a classic application of the Latin square. This controls, this design is meant to control for systematic variation that we can't control in an experimental system in space. The other way that we apply Latin squares is when there is a temporal component to uh, treatment application. And 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 this one, the, the commonest reason to use a Latin square design is when you want the same individual to be subjected to different treatments through time. So repeated measures is one way to call this kind of this kind of effect. Another one, if we want to control variation within a random, um, randomly selected unit, a randomly selected individual in ex experiment, we have the treatment, which is a fixed effect we're applying to the system. We have both fixed and random effects. That's a mixed model. So another way to call this temporal Latin square is it, it's a very specific version of a mixed effects model or a repeated measures model. OK, so the way this works, is you have a cohort, however many individuals you come in here uh, times the number of cohorts is your replicate size. And you can you can treat the order of the um, the treatments, you can treat the order of the treatments also as a as a block, as a blocking effect. Um, for this experiment, I'm going to tell you about it. it. It's it's this temporal repeated measures design. There are four treatments. In each of the cohorts, there are exactly two animals for a balance design. OK, and uh, that last part, the balance part, means that there's the same number of individuals in each of the cohorts. So there would be two in each of the cohorts. OK, so Latin squares are usually balanced. The controls are in a temporal design for the order. It's to control the order of application of the treatment. It's, it's got a lot of parallels. It's a very specific version of a mixed effects model. Another nice thing about this, even though it's been around for a long time and it's made for field trials, is they tend to have very high statistical power. A, a way, it's a very old fashioned way to say it. Um, and I and, it, and it, I have a, for technical reasons, I'm not going to elaborate on, I have difficulty fully accepting it when somebody says this to me. And yet, um, it is a very common thing for me to encounter with people who use this in their experiments is they'll say something to the effect of, I use Latin squares because the individual is its own control. And what they mean by that is that each individual um, is subjected to a control and the other treatments. Um, I, every, every repeated measures design is, is like that. So I, I don't really like that attributed just to the Latin squares for those technical reasons. <clears throat> Now, the problem that somebody came to me with was they said, listen, I've done these, these Latin squares a lot of times. I'm really, really good at it. I know everything about it. Um, 
usually I would do a balanced design. I put two animals in each of these. But listen, what happens if it's unbalanced? And I, you know, can I analyze it was one of the questions. And it, it turns out for analysis of variance, which is the way the traditional way that we would analyze this, this data. When we when we're missing certain lines of data from the set, the way that ANOVA handles that is that we, we would we would drop the whole row uh, usually. So we it would be as if we didn't use that individual at all. But if we had a if we had a design that was balanced with eight individuals, that's the minimum for which for one of these cohorts we could calculate a mean. Other than that, we've just measured one individual in each of these boxes. <clears throat> the question they said was, um, I think I'm going to have seven, but I'm probably going to have 6.5. And I was like, um, OK, what do you mean by 6.5? And they said, well, for two of the cohorts, I'm going to have the two individuals all the way through. and." Uh, <clears throat> For um, the uh, third cohort, same thing. So I have the six for three of these cohorts all the way through, but I only have seven cows. I don't have an eighth cow, and I know that one of them can't start. Remember, this is through time. I, I think one of them is only going to be able to start halfway through the experiment. That's what they meant by 6.5. So um, the answer was, if we use, if we use, um, if we use um, mixed effect model to analyze it, we can analyze it because we can, we can, um, we can control for the mix missing data. We can use Rimmel reduced error maximum likelihood to bring in the other other data. It's one of the many reasons why the linear model. Um, is the general linear model is is used today instead of the old fashioned ANOVA. <clears throat> but I had no idea about the power and what this would do. So that precipitated what I'm about to show you. So if you want to follow along with this, you can download the project files. They're all in a zip and you can just unzip that anywhere on your computer. If you have any doubt, about it, you can follow along and I'll follow, I'll do the whole thing from start to finish and you can do what I do if you want to follow along with it. If you do do that, your directory will look something like this. Okay. Before you click on anything, notice that there's an R project file. Any of you who have been working with me recently know that I've, I've adopted a a preference for working in project files. I'm just going to move my pad over here. Um, I have used them for years, but um, I've developed a strong preference for them under certain conditions. Like if there's more than one R script, I'll make a project file. If there's more than one data source, I'll definitely make a project file. And if there's if there's even a single output, I'll definitely make a project. It has a lot of advantages. Some of them are trivial and some of them are are more important. But for our purposes, the reason that I've started using projects almost exclusively have to do with reproducibility, many aspects of reproducibility. So it's my favored way to do it. I'm just going to bring up um, R. I'm going to close this because this is the this is the project. I'm going to open it up just like you would. So if we open it up, <clears throat> it may or may not open with any files open for you. I can't remember if I removed the data file, but before we start messing around with the code, I just want to show you around what's in here. There's a little bit of junk in here, and it, there's junk in here because um, I, I left all the FRAS in my project file because it, I, I didn't intend anybody else to reproduce this. This is, I, I thought I'd give you a peek at the way I actually work when I'm doing a um, full speed job. 
and, and it looks like this. I left all the, the trash and frass in here. It's got a data folder. Now, I asked the person who came to me if they had some, um, if they had some um, experimental data we could look at. And uh, they sent me some dummy data. I'll just open this real quick to show you what it looked like. And uh, it looked like this. There were some cows, individuals that would be repeatedly measured. Um, there were, in this example data, there were three diets, um, a control, something called DEO, and something called DY. There were times, which I ignored in the analysis after um, considering it. There was post-feeding concentration, and there was pH. Um, I think I analyzed all of these in a, in a descriptive way, but pH was the dependent variable, pH in the room and as a response to these different diets. Okay. And when I when I originally did the analysis, the the pH data had a very small difference. Um, and therefore the ex the experimental effect size, the expected effect size was very small. And here's here's my tidy version of the pH data with nice tidy names. Because the effect size was very small, the the we talked about the initial results, and the person came back and said, "Well, oh wait a wait a minute. If uh, the power is not so good on on that one, because it's small effect, um, let's look at ammonia. So I'm also interested in that, and so sent me another another dependent variable." And uh, the data are structured a bit differently. <clears throat> and um, the effect size is very different here, as you'll see. Okay, so I did essentially two complete power analyses for, um, for, for these two different effect sizes. I used open Excel. Um, I actually ended up not using that. that. As many of you know, that's my favorite way of reading in data from Excel spreadsheets. And I used my trusty old uh, LME4, which is um, my favorite mixed effects model package, as you know. LMER test. This is the package that gives linear mixed effects models their, um, their p value back, amongst other things. I use VisReg to visualize. Uh, regression. You, you see me use that a lot. EM means <clears throat> is a um, is a library that is used. I've mostly used it for doing post hoc effects. If you have a if you have a multiple regression or a linear model that's got more than one explanatory factor, you oftentimes might want to look at the the effect of one variable holding the other variable constant. Or another way of saying it is statistically removing the effect of the other variable. And EM effect, EM means allows us to do that. Um, GG effects is, um, I'll show you what that does. It's one of the GG plot tidyverse models. I'm, I may remember to point it out. Uh, read Excel. Now, the reason that I've used read Excel here is that. Um, <clears throat> The read Excel function is an alternative to open XLSX. The read Excel function is in the tidyverse, which uh, I have been using the tidyverse more, I have, must admit, sometimes. Uh, but I still prefer open XLSX. So the reason I use read Excel here is because um, read Excel reads it in the tidyverse, and I had this time variable I wanted to explore, and read Excel. Um, just reads the data in in a way that makes the workflow for dealing with time variable um, much easier. And Lubridate, uh, if you've ever worked with time variables, um, Lubridate is the easiest package and it works really well and it's very lightweight as well. Okay, so um, what you may need to do is uh, you may need to add this data folder to, the, to your code if you're gonna run it along, but I'm gonna read in the data. This is just the dummy data. Oops, I need to load the packages first. Three, two, one. 
then uh, read in the data, 321. It's going to pop up up here in the environment. I'm going to just make this a little bit bigger for you. 321. There we go. <clears throat> now uh, I've got the period, the cow, the diet, the time, post feeding concentration, and pH. One of the things I wanted to do is just look at how pH varies by diet. So I've aggregated this by the mean. We'll see the results down on the console, 321. So I can see that this pH variable has got very little variation due to the diets. The difference here is the difference between 6.095 and the largest one is 6.16. Um, if I look at the variation down here, we have uh, 0.29. So um, we can start to look at the difference here uh, divided by the pooled standard deviation. So I won't I won't reveal it yet, but you can see it's a pretty good size um, effect size if you do that calculation in your head. So I turn post feeding concentration, which is a numeric variable, into a factor. You can look at it change over here on this side if you want to. Three, two, one. It's a factor with seven levels. We're going to do the same thing to the period, which um, there were, I think, three periods. Three, two, one. Sarah, you need to uh, load and possibly install uh, OpenXLSX to get past that error. Um, for the time, I'm going to use the, um, the time data. Now, it, it's read in as a POSIX variable. Um, which is a time variable format, but I'm going to convert it to a factor. And I need to do a little formatting. I'm not going to explain that fully. Three, two, one. Okay. I'm, I made a couple of interaction plots, which are very powerful looking at uh, data like these to explain or to uh, examine the interaction between time and the diets that were, were fed and, and res with respect to pH. Three, two, one. This is time, diet, and pH. Each of the lines is a is a um, is a different diet. And what we can see is that there's a big time effect um, across here on pH. There's a big spike uh, in pH right here. But the, the, I'm not blown away by the difference between the diets. Okay, so small effect size is what we expect. Let's look at the difference between cows' diet and pH. Three, two, one. Here are the cows, they all have cute names. What we can see is that there's loads of variation for the control, much less variation for the two treatments. The mean between the treatments, so that would be the mean between all of these points, the mean between these points and so forth, is not very different. It's a pretty flat line. There's a little bit of a difference, but it's pretty flat. So then, um, if I look at the overall mean of pH, <clears throat> irrespective of anything, it's 6.11. And if I aggregate pH, oh, I didn't put a list. I think that's just orphan code. <clears throat> I did want to look at a statistical model, just a quick and dirty linear model looking at diet and post-feeding um, concentration. I'm just going to quickly run this and print the ANOVA results down here, three, two, one. And uh, what I'm looking at here is the, um, the p-value for diet is not significant when we also have post-feeding con uh, concentration, which is the big um, explainer for, for this particular model. Remember, this ignores, the plain linear model ignores variation between cows, and we can see some variation, quite a lot, in how um, cows are responding. Quite a lot, I say. pH is a log scale. Uh, I think this is a pretty big difference on a log scale between the individuals. So to do that, uh, I can't remember why I excluded um, Freya on that line, but I'm just running the whole data down here, so I'm not going to run that line. I'm going to load up LME4. That's to run linear mixed effects models. I'm going to run diet and time interaction effect, 
holding cow as the random variable. Look at the summary, 3, 2, 1, down in the console. Now we run the summary on these models. The thing I'm interested in as I scroll all the way up to the top to this field right here with random effects. This is this is almost the only field I'm interested in at this point in this output or summary. What I'm interested in is this column for variance. So I want to look at the the variance of the cow, which is 0 0.003 relative to the residual variance plus the cow variance. Okay, so it's 0 0.003 plus 0 0, uh, divided by 0 0.046 or something. So it's a very small amount of variance. So cow doesn't really matter that much in this model, but it is a repeated measures model and we we'll probably leave it in there because we know that's the model. And we want to remove even that little bit of effect. We can look at the um, the uh, main effects of diet time and the interaction effect with the ANOVA function. We see that only time matters. We know that that's not surprising because of this interaction effect plot. It would lead me to expect this. OK, so I made one final interaction plot. Which is um, <clears throat> diet time and pH. And it turns out each of these lines are different times versus pH. Look at how big that effect is. Look at the modest effect it has across diet. Now th this is the most representative picture of the model I just ran. And if I use GG predict, so it's quite a neat little function. OK, so GG predict what it does is it takes the fit from my model. And it predicts the um, the mean values with a confidence interval of the of the dependent variable. You know, relative this to this um, model relative to the um, to just the predictors, the random or the fixed effects. So I wrote this one. I think I just did this because um, we were talking about sampling the cows. So it's just a way to sample the cows uh, to, to look at variation over time. OK, so this was the first thing I did. And I just want to look at the time. We've got 10 more minutes, still have plenty of time. Now, the simulation of the fixed effects models. Um, I'm going to remove everything from my. Uh, from my um, workspace here, like I like to do. And. Um, this is how I set up the power simulation. So my my aim here was to remember we, we were simulating a mixed effects model. And uh, the, the general approach to simulating power for a model like this is to, um, <clears throat> you have an observed data set, or if you have a, um, an estimate of the means and the variation for different effects that you expect. I'm just going to go back to my slides for one second to make this real clear. If we were going to model this, I'm going to write it in a real sloppy, um, real sloppy way. We've measured something like pH, and we've re measured that for um, for each individual. So we might have a um, a beta zero. That's our overall intercept for the model. If we have a couple of diets, we might have a beta one or diet one plus a beta zero, um, two for diet two, it's, and so forth. We'd have one of these for each of the diets. Now, um, the control would be the case where um, there's a, it's just the mean effect. 
this is the way the matrix is for um, calculating linear models. But then we might have a an individual effect. We'll call it G for individual J, and then we'll have error. So um, when we simulate a data set, we need to have estimates of all of these effects to be able to simulate our, our model. My, my general approach here was to <clears throat> simulate um, randomly simulated effects based on our expectation of the averages and the variation that we observe in the pilot data and to simulate new data sets as if they were drawn from the population we've estimated from those sims based on this um, equation, the equation of the model we're going to analyze with the experimental data, the real experiment. And I want to do that for the situation uh, where we have different sample sizes. This would be like power. And the sample sizes might be um, might be six, seven, or eight. Now, um, eight is the fully balanced design. Seven is how many cows we have, but we we know that our power is somewhere between six and seven because of the missing samples. And furthermore, I randomized this with respect to which treatments had missing samples. Okay, so we're going to get some curves that look something like. Um, like this, and each of these <laughs> are different effect sizes. So we've we've estimated one particular effect size from the sample data, but a, a standard practice for a power analysis like this, any power analysis, including a simulation one, would be to say, right, this is the one that I expect based on my data, but what if I'm a little bit wrong and it's a little bit higher or lower? So we tend to to do it like that. So if I go back here, I'm just going to load up all my <clears throat> all my plots. And uh, what I did was I did this fairly manually because I knew I was only making one report. Um, I, I manually ran the the code several times for each of the different sets of settings. Uh, rather than fully automating everything. There was no reason for me to fully automate everything because I was tinkering with it and I knew it only needed to do it a few times. So I've got eight cows. There are four diets. There are four cohorts. The overall mean I calculated from the sample data, 6.12. Standard deviation per cow, that was the value that I showed you was um, I, I don't think I showed you the calculation. I think I showed you the random effect variance, but 0.04 is what we use. Standard deviation um, for the fixed effect for the rest leftover residual variance, 0.29. I just simulated some names, some other cute names of eight cows, just like um, they do in cow research, I guess. Um, and I made this little set of... Um, of data where I've got the the cow where I'm just going to replicate the names and I'm going to replicate them each by the number of diets. It's just going to pop up over here. So I've, I've parameterized everything I need here, the number of cows and the number of diet. I've just set those parameters based on the expected data. So I'm going to um, simulate cow. I'm going to simulate um, the diet by systematically allocating the diet, whereas I've randomly allocated the cows. The cow effect is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. One for each cow and the standard deviation for each cow, the mean of each cow, the standard deviation of each cow. Um, the cow effect size, let me see. Now I'm going to calculate, I calculate the effect size for each cow, then I replicate that cow effect because each of the cow has repeated measures. Then for the diet effect, I again draw this from a Gaussian. It's the number of cows times the number of diets based on my expected residual standard deviation. 
So if I run all of that and then I add it to a data frame on line 33, I'm just going to run that. It's going to pop up up in the um, global environment, 321. Now I have a data set of uh, what I expect. And um, now I'm going to, uh, for each cow, run it through that, uh, that equation with the cow effect and the diet effect, 321. I'm going to add that to my prediction of the pH values. You can see the pH values, printed them out down here as well. They are in line with the, what I expect. Of course, they will be because I've just modeled them based on uh, that sample data. So this should very closely resem resemble the, the sample data. Now here, um, I just went through a little thing where I randomly um, did the random effect model. I'm not going to run that right now. But we can just see what it looks like. Maybe I will run it. It's just to just to check the random effect for my random simulation of data. Here, the, the cow contribution to variance is very low. Of course, if I randomly simulate all of that, there'll be little differences, but it should be in the ballpark. So I'm just doing this for a sense check. This is a function that I wrote that basically just does all of that stuff and down to and including running that linear model. And the function will pop up over here, three, two, one. There it is. So um, the, that first part was me just setting the pieces together. Um, we have right to the last second. So um, what the rest of this does, I'm just going to say verbally, is that it um, it essentially um, runs that simulation in a for loop. I think I ended up running it, uh, yeah, OK, 100 times. I think I ran it 1,000 times for my actual results. The last thing I'm going to do, since we're out of time, so I'm just going to show you the results. Is uh, I dropped the parameters from the experiment that I ran. Here are the parameters from the equation. Here are the um, pH parameters for the um, the overall expected mean, the effect size due to the diets one, two, and three, the individual effect. Uh, for each individual cow, and the variance due to residuals. And uh, these are the settings for pH. I didn't run through the settings for ammonia, but these are the analogous ones for ammonia. Um, I, I can go through the effort of formatting this in a markdown document to output my report, but I did not do that. I made a picture of it in Excel. Um, just because it took less time and I knew it would only do it once. And then I have outputs of my um, experiments. I'm not going to show them to you here. I'll walk you through them in the in the um, in the report. The markdown document, if you want to look at it, is um, <clears throat> it's right here. It's actually right here. It's the dot rmd, not the nit dot md. It's the rmd. I'm not going to open that one though. I'm just going to show you the report the interest of time. So you can look at how I formatted the report. I've output it to a PDF. I have a summary. Um, that's just the things that I told you about the experiment before in very terse language. I've um, put a regression form of the equation here. Um, you know, quite sloppy by um, math or stats notation standards, but um, I'm not making this for a stats or math person, I'm making this for uh, an experimental scientist. So I put it into language that they would understand. The bold B indicates that it's a matrix of the diets. Um, I explained the parameters that I used, and I explained the results. And the the main results are right here. So for pH that has a relatively low power, I've um, estimated the variance. The median is the one, the green line, which I've estimated from the, um, the parameterized data. And then I've asked, what if 
what if the variance is um, a little bit low or high compared to uh, what I actually estimated? The horizontal red dash line is uh, the 80% power. And the purple dot is the sample size of seven. We know we have a sample size of seven, at least for some of the treatments. Um, that uh, is the expected power. So for this one, we see we are lower than 80% um, power, and we actually expect it to be down here on the line, about halfway down from the, the scientists uh, expected sample size. So for pH, we do not expect this to meet the threshold for good experimental design. For ammonia, the story is different. 80% power lines way down here, and the effect size was so big that even if we're wrong on how much variance there is, if there's a lot more variance, and if we only have six cows, we're still way above the threshold. Now, this is just a graph. This is the same graph I showed you before for the different cows that are used to parameterize the simulation. But this is what the um, pilot data looked like for ammonia. So it was just a huge treatment effect. And that's why we have this, this extreme expectation. So I think we stopped there. We're out of time. We're five minutes over. There are, I, I'm happy to answer any questions or comments or anything. We went really fast, and I did have to skim over the uh, simulation part. But you can play with it. And that's exactly the approach we could do. By the way, you could use the simulation approach even for simple designs. I, If I were doing my own work, I would often do the simulation approach. Um, it's considered more accurate uh, than uh, the parametric um, calculations in Cohen these days. And it's so easy to do. I'm going to stop the recording.